Welcome back to the Lou Perez podcast. My name is Lou Perez, and I'm happy to report that right now you can order my book. That's right. I wrote a book. It's called That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore on the Death and Rebirth of Comedy. Follow the link in the description or head over to Amazon and search for Lou Perez. That joke isn't funny anymore. If you want other options on how you can buy my book, please sign up for my newsletter at theluperez.com. You could also join my community at theluperez.locals.com. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. And if you could leave a five-star review, that would be amazing. Whether you're a long-time listener or first-time, five-star reviews are lovely. If you're looking for other ways you can support me, you could do so by supporting my sponsors. If you're into CBD products, please check out PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Use promo code Lou to get 25% off purchases over $75. And if you like cold brew, check out Black Organic Cold Brew at www.blvckbrew.com and use promo code Lou for free shipping. All right, let's go. Very happy to be joined by John Brodigan. You may know him from his work at Louder with Crowder, and also he uh, is a political and cultural color commentator. That's how I put it. Um, so he's been a he's been a, a very uh, very helpful uh, friend uh, over the years. He's um, uh, shared a lot of my work, and I really appreciate him uh, doing that. He doesn't have to do that. So understand if any of you guys are creators out there and you find somebody who, you know, likes what you're doing and, and puts it out to their audience, just know they don't have to do it. Um, so uh, we need a, uh, when it happens, we're very appreciative. So Brodigan, thank you for joining me, brother. Uh, you're welcome, though. I'm not sure if I still want to be here. Uh, have you have you pissed off any more of my rock and roll heroes that you've driven from Twitter? <laughs> oh, go. yeah. Can we start? Well, well for, uh, for one, I want everyone to know that we are recording this on valentine's day okay so that's good that's going to color every single thing that's happening right now Um, where there may or may not be a civil war happening in canada as we speak which we'll get to in a little bit yeah we will we will get to uh all of this but before the first thing that we need to talk about is the great skid row frontman sebastian bach (laughs) because because i believe that's who you're referencing yes yes that that and, and your uh your stupendous <laughs> democracy reference that I, I I rarely ever get so impressed by a a random reference where I'm just like, wow. All I could say is, wow. Yeah. Well. Well. Uh, so for for those of you who don't know, uh, Sebastian Bach uh, from uh, Skid Row. Uh, it was a I don't know if you, if they were necessarily called like a hair metal band. I think that they, they sort were, of they were near the end. Yeah. They they kind of made the transition that I think Alice in Chains made as far as look wise because there was yeah. a time where Alice in Chains was kind of glam well, or, or glam rocky you know kind of hair metal looking and then they kind of made a transition. So yeah, Skid Row is kind of at the end of that. And Sebastian Bach he's on Twitter apparently. I didn't I didn't know that until people started sharing. I didn't know uh, he was still alive. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't know that, and he was sharing something about. I mean, I guess he's pro censorship. I, I guess it's just a way to, to say. I mean, it. I mean, for the most pro pro censorship, or just like a complete ignorance of the Constitution, where right. it was like uh, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom to lie. And ah. set aside the fact that I think we have different different definitions of what a lie is. That's exactly what freedom of speech does. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, so I came across his tweet and I retweeted it and I said, maybe in your damn ocracy. Um, <laughs> and he blocked you. Yeah, and he blocked me. Yeah. I, it's like, for <laughs> one, the, the I, I always, I'm just always amazed at the idea that I have, you know, somehow access to these people, you know, that I can it's insane, somehow, right? it's crazy that, the, and, and the idea that not only can I see their stuff, but they might see my stuff. And then they see it and go so far as to block me for that is uh, is is pretty amazing. So for those of you who don't know the reference, because you're not going to turn 40 years old this month like I am. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so Democracy was a a rock super group that was put together by VH1. Yes. They, they had a, they had a reality show. Uh, was it, it wasn't Rock of Love? No, that that was a that was a dating show. I forget what is. We'll call it the we'll call it the democracy show. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so they they brought together uh, Sebastian Bach on vocals, Ted Nugent on guitar, the uh, bassist. I think his name is Evan Seinfeld from. No, uh, was, I think it was Michael Ian. 
Well, no, actually, no. Wait, I think they had. Right, yeah, Michael Ian was the uh, was rhythm guitar. Guitar play. Oh, uh, um. Oh, now I'm now I'm showing my age. He's, he's I'm, from I'm, Biohazard. I'm yeah. Uh, who, who? Suicidal tendencies. Oh, is he from Suicidal Tendencies? I think he was from Suicidal Tendencies. Okay. No, he was from Corn. No, no. <laughs> he could be from Biohazard. He could be from Suicidal Tendencies. Wait he could second. be keep, from Corn. Keep, keep talking. I'm going to look this up right now because I'm confused. Well, 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 well now that you, I mean, now that you put it out there, I mean, all three of those bands have a guy that look exactly like this dude. I think his name is Evan Seinfeld. It was um, Evan Seinfeld. Yeah, and then the uh, the drummer I think was uh, Jason Bonham. Yes. Uh, uh, John Bonham's son, and oh my god, how do I know all this stuff? And uh, Evan, guess, Evan Seinfeld from Biohazard. Yeah, uh, I could I could have sworn the guy from Corn was in it. He might have been in something else down uh, down the road. They had a oh yeah, what was it? Head? No, no. There's head monkey in um in Corn. Yeah, I, I, remember, had, I, I actually had had head in my car one time. Look at that Va Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to um. I used to work backstage at Nassau Coliseum because I used to, I used to go to college across the street where we do concerts. Okay. And I just just as a runner, I you know I I would get paid to sit outside a production office and occasionally get someone cigarettes. And um, the band gets in there and court and head had to go mail out his uh, mail out his bills, but he wanted to find a post office. And, and I just remember like when I'm, I'm driving up the ramp and he did like the douchey thing where you put on your sunglasses. Yeah. And I'm like. Okay, this is weird. I'm like, we're driving around. We, we, uh, long story short, we we found out that the post office was closed, and he was angry at me the entire time. My God. Um, so you were in college at the time. Did you go to Hofstra? Is that? Uh, no, I went to the, I went to the other college on the Hampton Turnpike. What, what what is the other? Is that Nassau? That's community? Nassau. Yes. Okay, Nassau community. Um, wow. You know, I actually I'm actually thinking I saw Corn live at Nassau Coliseum. I forget what tour it was. Family um, Values. It might have been. Yeah, it might have been like the Family Values tour. Uh, and it was wild to think that there was a time where, you know, they would sell out, you know, uh, arenas and stadiums. Yeah. And then I remember probably, I mean, maybe like 10 years ago, seeing them in like the Roseland Ballroom, uh, like a really small venue. And it was probably uh, like half comped. <laughs> it, it, it might have been. Well, although, uh, although, uh, do, you, do you ever listen to the band Helmet? Do you ever? I, I, I didn't, I didn't listen to the band itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I do love the Judgment Night soundtrack. Judgment, yeah, yeah. And I have, um, oh, just another victim is, is on my gym work, my workout uh, playlist. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just another victim. That was a um, collaboration. It was Helmet and House of Pain, and then also bringing it all around. There, uh, Biohazard did a uh, a song with Onyx by Onyx. Onyx, man, yeah. One of my favorite rap lyrics. I'm gonna raise hell and make the white man call me master. Look at that. But nice. it was the lead singer of Onyx who said it, so he can get away with it. <laughs> yeah, if it was a white dude, it would be kind of weird. It would be uh, <laughs> like, what? What are you doing? Like, but, I'm, uh, not, I'm not calling you master. Biohazard guy. Uh, so with with Helmet, uh, they there was a 20-year a anniversary of their album, Betty. And um, I went to the 20-year anniversary show in uh, in New York. And I think it was mm -hmm. like, like the Hammerstein Ballroom or something like that. And um, I go there and they're all dudes. Everybody's kind of dressed the same. Like everybody has, you know, jeans, the same kind of like, uh, you know, like, uh, like a foreman jacket, uh, a baseball cap <laughs> for a helmet. Yeah. Yeah. For, for a helmet. And, uh, one of the, one of the funniest, but also like kind of saddest things that I saw, uh, at one point, I forget what song it was, but this guy tried to crowd surf and, his, I don't know where this is going. Everybody's going. I'm well, at that guy. Yeah, and everybody's like, you know, push either forty or pushing forty, and they it took them a very long time to get their friend up. And then by, the <laughs> by the time they got him up, and they tried to pass him to other people of the same age demo, uh, it was just kind of over. It's not like he fell and got hurt or anything. It was just it. There, there was a, a sense of, oh man, I'm. I'm 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 really too old for this, and that, that now I think that was kind of sad. I, I left before uh, any encore was uh, was done. Yeah, see, I, I the one show I saw at Hammerstein, it was an Iron Maiden show, but it was going back like, like 15 years because they just reunited. They had just reunited with their lead singer and all of their guitar players, and it was cool because I mean, if you ever listen to Iron Maiden, they had like uh, their uh, their mascot Eddie. They had one specific for every song, mm. so they would change the backdrop and you would know what song was coming up on. 
And I would have enjoyed that, except there, there's this one guy in the audience that was intent on starting a conversation with me. Uh, as you would know, you can't generally hear what people are saying. Uh, as hard as he would try screaming right in my ear. So while I could not hear a thing that he was saying, I uh, felt everything that he was saying. <laughs> that, that caused more post concert tinnitus than, than like the trooper did. Oh my god! Yeah, th there's there's something about um, just about concert etiquette that that I I will never understand other people. Uh, my my wife and I years ago we went to uh, a Bon Iver concert, not you know not not quite a metal concert, Bon Iver, and. Uh, the dude has, I think, maybe like, you know, three or four more songs, you know, before the night's through. And then behind me is this guy, like, sh shouting, hitting on a girl, you know, and and and, and having this conversation. Literal meme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was <laughs> insane. I'm just like, you know, turning around. And uh, I don't think Bon Iver, bon Iver is, a, is a concert where, you know, people are, you know, guys are going to be like, hey, dude, shut the fuck up, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it's... Uh, it's just amazing just how many people, how little it takes for other people to ruin anything, yes. ruin things for me. And I, and I'm kind of like a magnet for it. I'm, yeah. I'm, you, usually just being around people ruins things for me. <laughs> I don't leave so, my house much. Yeah. So what is, you know, what um, uh, you've been uh, doing stuff with uh, louder with Crowder uh, for a while. How long have you been? Uh, I, think, I think about six years, six years. Wow. Yeah. He had, um, when he was first starting, uh, getting ready to do uh, start what became the show, uh, he was looking for conservatives who had a sense of humor, and at the, especially at the time, there weren't many of us. Right. So he re he reached out to a friend of mine that I used to do a podcast with, uh, Bre Brandon Morse from Misfit Politics and uh, Every Joe for a little bit, and he put in connection, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. Do, um, do you ever think about uh, making the move uh, over to? I think they're in Texas now, or it's been it's been offered a couple up a couple times. My family's here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if they ever weren't here, then yes. <laughs> right. Right. No, I, I I hear you on that. Um, yeah, like people we we my wife and I we moved to uh, New Jersey from New York, mm -hmm. and uh, people are like, "Why? Why would you do that?" And it's like, well, you know, we have babies and we got you know grandmothers around here, man. You know? Yeah, it's 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 kind of it, as much you know. It's it, it's you have to weigh the opportunity, which you know obviously it's a great opportunity with the fact that I've, I'm gr I'm growing up with my niece. I'm growing up, my nieces and my nephew are growing up three blocks away. Right, and it, that's that's, that's kind of hard to like go, even though I know there's gonna there's gonna be a point. The youngest is three, so figuring about five years once he starts making fun of friends, where all at once none of them were going to want anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. Then I'll look back. I'll be like, oh, I should have moved to Texas ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the time to uh, uh, to get in. You know, I got I got to say, I don't meet uh, uh, other than my friends from Long Island. I don't just like meet people from Long Island anymore. You know, um, I, yeah, I, I we tend not to leave Long Island. Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> you know, you know, you know, occasionally we go into city for heavy metal shows. That's about it, right? Yeah, the. Uh, yeah, my, my my parents, my my family's out in Little Neck, um, okay. which is at the end of Queens, you know. So it's not technically uh, Queen. Uh, technically. It's, it's Queens adjacent. If if, yeah. if if they were buying a place, they would call, they would call it like New York City adjacent. Yeah, yeah. If it, when, when it's you know up and coming, uh, that's what they're uh, <laughs> they're going to call it. But yeah, I miss I. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about. It. I used to take like you know uh, Long Island Railroad in all the time, and then you know have those times coming back late, you know, late night, and you know all the dudes who you know the were drunk, drinking drinking way too much drinking way too much uh, waiting for that ron Konkama line and all that <laughs> i'm like that's a that's a tough commute i have a i have a friend who wants to come out just to ride the drunk train because um how i met your mother i guess the two guys who wrote it i think the story was they, they used to write for letterman but they were from, from long island okay so they worked the long island drunk train into um the show uh, I, I think it, it was um I can't think of the characters' names. Wow, um, Barney. It was it was Barney, one of the other guys, because Barney wanted to pick up chicks, and it, it was it was the, the, the their definition of the drunk chain was over the top ridiculous, and you would think it was a parody, and they just went too far. Unless you've ever ridden the two hundred five train going to Babylon, going out to Babylon, and yeah. they actually dialed it down a little bit. So ever ever since my friend my fr friend wants to has been wanting to visit Long Island just so well we can ride the drunk train. It's like. I'll do it one more time, but literally that's it. That's it for the rest of my life. I've, I've, I've been stuck in that train too, too much for one lifetime. 
And and it's a tough one too because it's one of those uh, one of those trains where if you miss it, you got to wait until like you know the I guess the the people of the employed commute. You know when people when people with jobs you know start coming. You know how many uh, hours that later? Once. My uh, my first time in the city, uh, my friend's band was playing CBGBs, which obviously dates me because most most people watching won't even know what a CBGBs is anymore. They just know it's a T-shirt. It's a, yes, yes, it's a, that T-shirt that you could buy at Forever Twenty One. It used to be an iconic uh, punk rock club, and I had no idea that the train stopped running after a certain time. I just assumed that there were two trains running every hour, and so I figured I'll, I'll just catch the next train. And when I got there, it was like two o'clock in the morning, and the next train was until five thirty, which it was in college. Of course, this was the one time my parents stayed up. I'm not <laughs> gonna call them. I'm just gonna wake them up, and it didn't work out. Yeah. But yeah, ever since then, I, I've always made it a point to make sure I, I know the train time is and when the, the last train before the last train is, because that last train is, is the full blown drunk train, yeah. which if, if you're taking a, if you're taking a babble online, you get, it's a triple because you, you get the drunk train until Jamaica, uh, half the drunks get off. Then you get, then you, you stop by Rockville center, you get all those drunks. And then before they get out, you get all the want to drunks from OKs. So it's 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 one of Dante's sets at nine levels of hell or seven, however many circles of hell. The, the, the babel the Babylon train at two o'clock in the morning is one of them. My God, now I want to I want to see the one man show where you play every single one of those characters because there's little <laughs> there's little differences in between you know uh, every single one of them. There, there, there there's a different drunk you know going out to Great Neck. There's a different yes. drunk going out to uh, you know. Port Washington, then Belmore, Merrick. Hold on, you got some really different trucks yeah. going out there. You, 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 you have that one couple that hooked up at the club, but they, they, they were glad to be apart from each other, and they wound up in the same train ride on the way home. <laughs> uh, you, you've got the forty-year-olds who come coming home from a rock and roll show and finding out the hard way that we're way too old for this shit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it used to be because I'm from. Uh, I, I grew up in in Queens and and uh, Little Neck, and then I, I went to school in Manhattan. I went to St. Mary's uh, okay. High School, so I'm the pride of of St. Mary's High School. Um, and uh, I remember, win. yeah. So I remember, you know, I forget when when it was the first time that I was able to go into the city, either by myself or with my group of friends. Mm -hmm. Had to be like either, you know, middle school or definitely high school, and. Um, I'm trying, you know, talking with you, I'm, I'm sort of like reliving the excitement of going into the city uh, and experiencing it as, you know, we were, we were outsiders. I didn't realize this at the time, but bridge and tunnel. Yeah. I was, I was that I was bridge and tunnel, you know? Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's something uh, about that, that I'm kind of, uh, I don't know. Kind of reliving with you in a way, you know. <laughs> I'm glad I can help. See, I never my my dad my dad was a cop, so he never wanted to go into the city. Mm. So for me, it wasn't until college, where as like um when I was at NASA, I used to book the concerts there. So they would send us to C, um, CMJ every year, which I mean to the to the three people who don't know what I'm talking who, who other than the three people know what I'm talking about. It was like this big college music uh, conference. And that was like my first time in a city. I remember walking down the street. I was like, "Oh, so, so this is what the real this is what the real world feels like." Like I, I was almost expecting to hear Spoonman playing in the background. <laughs> well, what was it, what was it like booking shows uh, for a college? I mean, that seems like that seems like for one, it's a lot of fun, but also a lot of pressure to put on a young kid. You know what it is? It's not so. It wasn't that much pressure because at NASA, the the the, the, um, the venue capacity was four hundred fifty people. Okay. So it's not it's not like it was it's not like it was that hard to sell out, and it was and it wasn't our money. I mean, it was it it was it was it was, it was part of the student activities budget. So it basically it was no risk or reward. We we could just like being like we had um we, I think when I was there we booked the Google Dolls, uh we booked Candlebox. Holy shit, Candlebox! We, we, we booked Candlebox, which we got which we could have gotten for like seven hundred and fifty dollars because they were on tour with Rush. <laughs> so and they were playing the Coliseum across the street, and so they figured like, well, we, we might just pick up shows while we're on the tour anyway. And but but for this is actually my first intro introduction to politics, and and how messed up bureaucracy can be because we could have gotten them for for seven hundred fifty dollars and put the money towards a bigger act, like you know later in the show, but we couldn't let the school know that we can get acts for only seven hundred fifty dollars. Wow. So so we had to offer we had to offer them five grand. So basically, like you were kind of like part of the military-industrial complex, you know. Yes, more of... or less. 
Yes, it, it, it was it was it was my, it was my first my, my first introduction into that. What, what, and what and you, we had MTV's the state. Oh, you, you had MTV. Oh, the state uh, performed. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I went to NYU. Um, so the state. I think they they formed at NYU. Yeah. Um, so people are always are always like, oh, you must have loved the state. I wasn't that big of wasn't that big of a fan of the uh, of the show. See, for for me, because it, it's um, like it came out in college. I, I had a. I've always been more of a, ske a sketch guy than a stand up guy. Mm -hmm. So, like you know, you know, mid eighties Saturday Night Live, and they, they, the kids I discovered the kids the kids in a home when I when I was in high school. And the thing with the state is that I discovered in college around the same time I also discovered drinking and you know other things. So maybe that made it seem funnier. But right. with with my college friends, like half of our half of our vernacular was lines from the state. I want to dip my balls in it, Louis. <laughs> yes, uh, that was actually well. The, the, to, to this day, one of my all time favorite sketches they actually did when they did our concert, where one of them came out and they said, "Well, we're not going to do any 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 of our popular characters because you know we're better than that, and you know we want to do something new." Uh, but we understand that you may not like that, so we're going to throw you a bone because it'd be like Billy Joe not singing Piano Man. Mm -hmm. They had Louis, um, Barry and Levon, and Doug came out and all in character singing Piano Man. Oh, wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Yes. When I was 19, I thought that was hysterical. Well, now, I'm just, now I'm just sick of hearing Piano Man because I've been to one too many kar karaoke bars throughout the country. Yeah. Well, you know, I, got, I, gotta, I, I definitely got to give the state credit and I got to give um, a lot of, well, a lot of comedians uh, credit who will, t will take even just like, half an idea or half a character and just build a world around it mm -hmm. and just go and just go for it. Cause Louis, Oh, I remember his, his, his catchphrase is I want to dip my balls in it, which I can imagine them. I, who knows how, how, you know, they came up with it, but I can imagine him coming up, uh, Ken Marino coming up with it, you know, one night when they're all out drinking and, yeah. you know, and having fun and just doing it and they're cracking each other up and they're like, Fuck, we got to do something with this. Okay, what do you want to do? Let's let, let's build this. You know, let's build this whole world out. And and I think so much of uh, I, that's such a necessary thing to do when it comes to when it comes to comedy. You know, yeah, I, I I think some of the best stuff comes from like the first dumb idea that comes to your mind. Yeah, and figuring just hey, what the hell, we'll give it a shot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, I guess that this leads into I remember uh, a few years back uh, on Louder with Crowder, uh, Stephen had on uh, Michael Ian Black. Um, oh, wow, that was that was actually that was a uh, that was that was that was that was pre conservative uh, conservative review, which was pre the blaze like, years ago. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I I thought that was a cool conversation for them to have. For one, I, I it was uh, it it was it feels like such a different time where you could have you know conservative oh, Crowder. It, it totally is. Like I I I, I barely yeah. remember it because I I don't think I started. It was I think it even predates me. Okay, but I remember him doing it. I remember just thinking, thinking it was cool. It's like you know, hey, you could do this. You could do this on the internet now. And I think it started just from them getting into a fight on Twitter one time. Yeah, and 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 uh, he had he had DL Hughley on as well at, yes. at one time. Yeah, and now I mean, you know, who, uh, I guess what the closest if you guys are able to get Trevor Noah on, I mean, that's probably you know that'll be that, that, that'll that'll be that'll be interesting. I mean, and yeah. also like I think you know conversations like that. Providing they don't go sideways, like I, if, if I remember correctly, the D.L. Hewley one went like to the point where they were fighting during the commercial break. Oh wow! I, I think it's, it's you know I think I, I think I, I always think it's valuable if people can find common ground, mm -hmm. at least to start. And then if one of the if, if one of the two parties doesn't want to find common ground, then you, you just have to increase the intensity. Yeah, and I think there's something uh, I don't know. I think there's something valuable val valuable for people who work in the same space you know if you work in comedy yeah i think there's something value like because you're not uh, you know you, you're not uh talking it, it's not like you know you have a astrophysicist and you're trying to have an argument with them and you're you know you're not an astrophysicist like you're you're a part of the same uh uh you know uh, the same, the same. part of the same universe yeah yeah exa exactly and it's, it's like, like, like you, you you have a certain world where i think only like you know x amount of people could actually relate to some of the things that you had to deal with. I mean, especially, especially now with the, the, the way, um, and you, you see with a lot of, with the Rogan stuff now that they're going through like every comedy bit he ever did where people are actively looking to go through stuff that you've done over the course of like a 20 year career right. and, and try and pull stuff out. That's not something you could explain to someone who 
works for one eight hundred flowers, right? Or yeah. is like you know a, a project ma a, a project manager of just like you know the maybe maybe not the constant fear, but just like knowing it's that you know anything you say at some point over the course of the rest of your life could be taken out of context. Yeah, and, and it, it, it can even be in context, but the context changed over the twenty years. Right. And, and, and also just the reality of that stuff is out there, you know, so Rogan's yeah. been do, doing his podcast for over 10 years. That's, you know, hours and hours and hours of material, not to mention his own, you know, the stand up bits that he's doing. Um, Cause uh, you know, with, with all the stuff that, that came out with, um, you know, the N word stuff. I mean, I remember, uh, I think it was David Cross who opened one of his either stand up specials or it might've been like a comedy central half hour special where he just said, I hate, N words, right? And then there was there was no follow up. Yeah, yeah, there it was. And then he went on to like another to another <laughs> bit, you know. And I mean that that that, that was the joke. I mean it was it's, right. He's not supposed to say it, but in the context of saying, "Oh wait, I know, I reverse that as I'll get back." I, I was confusing it. I was confusing it with the uh, the Sarah Silverman joke, where like I I love we'll call them c words. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, but that 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 was just to make with David Cross was just to make people like uncomfortable and just yeah. let it simmer a little bit. Yeah, good. But well, I, I, mean, I, was, I mean, that was also the thing is I think for a lot of people who predate social media, you used to be able to joke around with your friends, and you knew with your friends that the only definition behind your words was to get everyone else to say, "Oh my God, I can't believe you just said that." Right. Right. And you know, once 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 uh, you know people started getting on Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, assuming that they were joking around, they're still used to doing that because they knew anything they that, that they say, it's literally just to crack up your friends. Mm -hmm. And literally the, the, the most foul stuff you could possibly think of, because you just know, like, your your friends are going to be like, oh, my God, I can't believe you just said that. And now they're going to have to try and, like, like out, out offend you the next time. Mm -hmm. And I think I think for a lot of, you know, it's been a little bit of a learning curve. Sometimes, I mean, some you know, sometimes too much of a learning curve. I think people overreact to, like, um past things that were said and, you know, judge them too much by like, you know, today's standards or whatever today's standards are considered today because they could change tomorrow. But I think, I, I think a lot of it's just like for a lot of people, there was, it could also be like a 10 to 20 year learning curve because you're so used to just being able to just like joke around because everyone knew you were just joking around. Yeah. Like every, you know, as, as opposed to like someone like, you know, five States away who might not know that you were joking around and, you know, they're, they're offended now. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, I'm thinking about like, you know, the school of comedy that, you know, I'd probably put like Sarah Silverman and David Cross in and like kind of premium blend era, um, you know, comedians where uh, part of some of the stuff that they did was discomfort, you know, right. to, to make people uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, so when you're going that route, you know, when you think of the subject matter that's going to make people uncomfortable, that window really shrinks, you know, because it's like, OK, um, these are the topics that we could, uh, you know, that we could take on. Yeah. And then also, like, you know, a, a, a problem, the problem today where you, you just can't say it's like, oh, well, this was the joke I was thinking at this time. They have to come with like I, I'm I'm, sh I'm sure David Cross have done this where he probably has this long drawn out apology mm -hmm. where you know 800 words about everything he's learned since he did that one joke right as opposed to all right I, I thought it was funny 10 years ago I don't think it's funny anymore yeah let's move on yeah yeah um, uh, I uh, so I started uh, at the uh, the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York back in I think it was before yeah it was before I graduated so it was probably 2003. Okay. Or 2003 or uh, 2004. Uh, was, I was, was in a. This, was this when they had the show on Comedy Central for a little bit? Yeah, it was either the tail end. It was, it was either the. It had just ended. Um, okay. But it, this this was sort of. Uh, the theater was a was it a in a basement in uh, the basement of a Gristidi's uh, supermarket. Um, <laughs> so you know, looking back, I mean, good old John Casamitidis. Yeah, yeah, and his and his uh, and his daughter. I followed his daughter for a little bit on <laughs> on, on Instagram because a buddy of mine recommended it, uh, and I had to stop. I had to, there were uh, there, there was just uh, too much too much going on there. But <laughs> but you know we're you know I, I, performing comedy in a basement of a Gristidis where pipes leaked onto the stage. So oh yeah, uh, it was a Gristidis. Yeah, yeah. So so we would have like black garbage bags wrapped around you know the. <laughs> 
uh, you know, around the pipes just getting full of garbage juice while people were performing improv and, and sketch comedy. And um, at the, you know, at the time, uh, I didn't, I didn't realize just how good I had it back then. You know, the stuff that, <laughs> the stuff that was being performed on stage and, and being uh, yeah. experimented with. And uh, I remember this one year, uh, there was a, it was called the, uh, the Del Close Marathon. So it was like a weekend of nonstop improv. Okay. And uh, they would have like these midnight shows that would be really like oddball midnight shows. So one, I remember one, it was uh, Dice Prov. So every, every improviser was dressed and sounded like Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> So, ima so imagine the dice man doing oh, man. improv for that, 15 minutes. That seems like one of those things where it would be hysterical and then it would stop being funny. But if you waited like 20 minutes, it would go back to being hysterical again. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, it, would, it, it would get awkward in the middle where you, you're tired of hearing dice and then like the next dice go comes up and you're back to laughing your balls off. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they would do, they would do stuff like that. And then one, uh, one uh, marathon they did, Emanciprov. Emanciprov. Oh God. <laughs> so so Emanciprov, what that entailed was all of the black improvisers at this theater. And then there were uh, people who came in from out of town too. So black improvisers from out of town. They were playing slaves on a plantation Ooh. whose whose master was forcing them to do improv in front of this, you know white audience right and I'm, sorry, I, I'm, I'm laughing because i think that would still work today dude and that's brilliant yeah i made it i made it around five minutes in because and and i'm a dude i have a very tough stomach and yeah. you know especially with like out there stuff i was so uncomfortable uh and the uh the person who played the master you know the white you know uh slave master he's a very prominent comedian working today like beloved you know and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say uh you know there, say there's his not name. a day goes by that he does not go to bed and thank god that there was there were not cell phones back then yeah yeah nobody record nobody recorded this um so i made it around five minutes i had to walk out of the theater and then i don't know if it was like the next day or the following week or something like that i i uh i saw one of the guys who would put it together mm -hmm. and i told him like dude that made me so fucking uncomfortable. And he he just laughed. He was like, I know. It was great. <laughs> and there was there was something really, I don't know, man, just really special about that. You know, well, like, yeah, because I mean you know, I'm I'm going to assume uh that the black people playing slaves were in on the joke. Oh yeah. So <laughs> yes. again, it, it goes back to you're just joking around with your friends where everyone knows everyone, everyone in that room knows that the only definition between anything anyone is saying is just to get you to say, I can't believe you just said that. And then it'll be that person's turn. Yeah. Yeah. One, 100 percent. Um, and oh my God, I'm trying to remember. I, I can't even like, remember the shit that they were saying because they were all barefoot. They they, they all had like, like freaking like like kind of torn clothing and stuff. They and everybody and the, and the thing about too. okay. Yeah, dude, in costume, uh they, I don't know if if the guy if if the slave master had a whip. Um, it's quite, <laughs> dude, it's quite possible. This is starting to make me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, 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 and the thing is too, like everybody there studied at the UCB. Right. Hmm. And so one of the big things about the UCB is commit. You have to commit to the role. I mean, that's and the whole thing with improv. You have to, anything anyone says, you have to say, yes, you got, you got to go with it. You know, yeah. there's no, uh, you know, they have their whole mantra of, of don't think, um, and they committed hard, man. So there was like, you know, there was, uh, I don't know, there was like history on that, on that stage. Uh. See, I, 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 wa I wonder what, what it would be like now when people, because I, I used to, I, I dabbled a little in improv in high school, dabbled, meaning I wasn't very good at it. And one time I actually asked someone to tag me out so I can get off stage. But I, I, I wonder what it would be like today if the people who do improv can still be like that brave or that brazen or if they go up there and they're like they're they're limiting themselves from what they can say, or if people will actually just say like I'm not going to joke about that, like yeah. while they're on stage. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm pretty far removed from you know that community. It, yeah. it seems like I mean at least a decade I think you know since I've been performing there regularly and, and all that. And I know big cha big changes uh, 
uh, you know, went, went on with the, with the theater, but yeah, it was, uh, I don't know. It was a, uh, it was a fun, fun time, fun, uh, fun, interesting times. To be I remember they, on their show, they, uh, this is one of the funniest things sketches I've ever because it was the entire half hour episode. I'm going to butcher this. I'm going to call it. It was a little Jimmy fund. Oh, uh, okay, you know what I'm talking about that. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Where Jimmy, Jimmy was a guy who, uh, had a penis the size of an elephant's that he wasn't aware of. And for some reason that to this day, I don't understand uh, that made him mentally retarded. He was a child. Yeah. I, I, I thought he was an adult. Oh, I thought he was a child. Oh, <laughs> oh I thought, cause I think it's Matt, Matt Besser. I think Matt Besser plays him. I okay. thought, oh, Oh yeah, I thought. <laughs> well, maybe it isn't. Maybe, okay, maybe maybe it was an adult playing a child. But I what 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 I couldn't figure out why not being aware of your elephant size like dick would make you mentally challenged. Right, right. <laughs> it, was, it was like twenty minutes that I just I I I tear up just even thinking about it. I can't remember any of the jokes. Yeah, just the entire concept is enough to like to get me to get me laughing again. Yeah, and, and he's wearing you know very. Very short shorts. Like if he yeah. had, if he was a child, then his parents obviously put him in these these short shorts. They, they had a they had to blur it, but you could still see them strapping whatever it was for the for the show. They could still see him like the straps strapping it to his leg. Yeah. So yeah. So if if you I think about find this on YouTube now. Yeah. If anybody, so if anybody wants to look at you know watch that, I mean that's what got onto TV. So you can yeah. only imagine what uh, what only Getting what we did. We, we yeah. can only imagine what happened in the basement of Grassini's. Right. Right. Um, besides John Casamitidi's failed, failed mayoral campaign. Yeah, and for those of you looking for, you know, last minute Valentine's gifts, uh, although when this comes out, this is gonna be so bad. This is gonna be a few weeks past Valentine's Day. If, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for a very late Valentine's Day gift, meaning yeah. you forgot it was Valentine's Day and your girlfriend's still not talking to you. Yeah, three weeks from now, uh, <laughs> you know, head on over to Gristidi's. Um, I think there's another. Yeah, there is another. Um, they'll probably down there. they'll probably still have Valentine's left over in the rack. Oh yeah. Price. Yeah, they, they need to get rid of this stuff. They need to they need to move it. Um, <laughs> it's like his mayoral campaign depends on this uh, 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 on this thing. Um, what was I going to say? I'm sorry. Let me. Um, I'm going to cut that out. No, I'm going to keep it in. Okay. Um, my mind just went. Uh, my mind just went somewhere. Um, uh, I hate when so, that happens. Yeah. You ever, you ever run away train of thought? It leaves the station. Yeah, it leaves the Long Island Railroad <laughs> on the Penn drunk. station. On, on the drunk train of Penn Station. You can bring it back. Democracy, everybody. Democracy. <laughs> um, so, uh, all right, so we just said uh, it's it's Valentine's Day today. So this is a trip down memory lane for everybody. Uh, yes. Super Super Bowl was yesterday. I um, I didn't watch the game. Was it a was it a good game? It was good. I mean, for, for me, the Super Bowl was already the Bills against the Chiefs because I'm a I'm a Bill I'm a Bills fan, and you know that game played with my emotions. So after that, it was just like a good game, but you know, it was close. Mm -hmm. And then I, the only thing I, anyone, I, I saw anybody talking about was uh, the halftime show, which I did watch. So I was, yes. well, I was watching it in between, like uh, I think I was on Twitter. Uh, so in between tweets, I was uh, <laughs> watching the halftime show. Um, and uh, it's funny that that was so controversial. Uh, I don't get it. it was, so it was weird because, I wasn't, I mean, I, I was too busy enjoying the music in my life to notice anything like bad happening. Right. So I guess that, you know, the big thing is that Eminem like knelt, which watching the show, watching the performance, I, I didn't even notice. But what, what, what I find funny about it was that, I mean, never mind the fact that it was, um, it was a nostalgia act doing this, uh, doing a nostalgia protest. Mm -hmm. The only reason people seem to know about it was because they had to leak to the press prior to the Super Bowl. Because like, I think that there was an article on like one of the rap magazines. It's like, well, according to our sources, they uh, Eminem said he was going to do this, but the NFL told him no. And I, had that article not come out prior to the performance, I don't think anyone would notice that he knelt. Yeah, well, and, and it's t it, I mean, it's tough to notice that when nobody else on that stage knelt. Right. You know, it's it. It, it looked like it was part of the performance. He was, you know, he was saying a prayer to two. I mean, my my two biggest complaints was one, there was no hologram Tupac. Tupac. Because he mm. should have been there to do California love, and forget the kneeling. I I was I was more offended for poor like Fifty Cent who they had, had had like hanging upside down, looking like he just ate Lloyd Banks. Yeah, what was that about? What, what was what, what was the hanging upside down by his feet? About? His video, um, 
in the club when it, when it first oh. came out. But, oh, but this, I, this was 50 Cent when he used to, like, you know, I don't know, work out and lay off the carbs. Yeah. So it, it, it what did it take place? It took place at the Shady Aftermath uh, Performance Development Center, where uh, the scientists, uh, you know, had uh, basically basically created 50 in the same vein as, like, the $6 million man. Okay. And the opening scene was he was hanging upside down, and he turned out, and, he, and he, he, like, you know, he was hanging upside down, and then you, you, saw, you saw him upside down where he started doing the song. And they tried recreating it in the halftime show, but I, I, again, that was um, that was a lot of cheeseburgers ago. <laughs> yeah, somebody I'm talking about getting blocked. Um, there was uh, I, f- I forget what the what the guy's name is, but he tweeted out, "He's like, I would never have expected that the United States of America would come to accept these artists as a Super Bowl halftime performance." And it's like, yeah, dude, getting old sucks. Like these are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this yeah, I'm gonna be 40, man. Like, yeah, this is the music that was when I was a kid. So, and also, it's not. But and I'm sorry, you know, it's it's not that shocking anymore. Right. Like sh- shocking for me, uh, my old I, I, my oldest niece. She's nine now. When she was three, I, I guess they they used to listen to pop music, and um, daycare, which is a different story. Um, but you don't realize exactly how many bad words that aren't curses are in modern pop music until you hear them coming out of the mouth of a three-year-old. Mm. I mean, that was a day where we switched over to kids' bop. But you know, after like after like six years of that stuff, what was considered offensive, if you can even call it that, what was considered offensive in 1994, it's it's like still calling the Beatles offensive, right? Those damn mop tops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the I mean, sideburns. Like, oh, you're comparing Dr. Dre to the Beatles. No, I'm you're comparing the fact that when the Beatles came out, the same people would complain about, oh, they're offensive, and then they stopped being offensive. But then it was a new thing that was that was offensive, and you know now we're gonna have like, uh, actually, I, I can't, I can't, even, I'm so old, I can't even go with the analogy because I don't know who's big right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm no clue, uh, no clue who's big, but yeah, Bob, I, I, we'll say I'm we'll sorry. say Bob. Bob is big. And Bob and Bob's offensive, and Bob says all the wrong things. And like twenty years from now, Bob is going to be uh, the, the halftime show for Super Bowl seventy two. Mm-hmm. People can be like, I can't believe he was accepted Bob's song lyrics. They were. They, well, I saw people calling uh, calling the halftime show pornography, and I was like, you know, <sighs> I'm like, pornography is freely available uh, right now. There are a couple of browsers open on my <laughs> computer right now with it. I could just click over at any time, Brodigan, and, and check a, out porn. As a matter <laughs> of fact. Yeah. And it, it's it's like what what was what was pornographic about? I, I, what Mary was, J, Mary J Blige was what was pornographic dressed, about it is that those tr- those tweets were written before uh, the halftime show, mm, that's and they one. were already scheduled to go, and they figured, well, we got the material, so yeah, yeah. But no, um, like, there were barely even any girls. I mean, I mean, you know, whole, Kendrick's backup dancers were all guys. You know, the 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 the, the twelve people trying to hold up fifty cent were all guys. <laughs> The dudes on the on the pulley system. Yeah, the, the guys in the pulley system. It's like, oh my god, lay off the Taco Bell. Um, and it was, it was Mary J. Blige with a couple of backup dancers, and that was. And this is again, like I said, this is one of those things where I was too busy enjoying my life to even notice. I was just happy to hear yeah. hip hop with like a live band in the background. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whether or not the band was lip sync, well, the band wouldn't be lip syncing. Whether or not the band was playing a pre recorded act, it, it at least looked good. Yeah, and I didn't recognize uh, uh, Dr. Dre when because uh, he was playing piano for a little yeah. bit, and then I recognized. I was like, "Oh shoot, that's uh, that's Dr. Dre." I did not, I did not know that. So, he plays but, piano um, now. Yeah, but I, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the performance. I thought it was cool. Um, I still think that the best perform uh, halftime show performance ever is Prince. Um, Hands down. I mean, the dude. I, like, I'm going to say this: the dude made it rain. During purple, he was rain. that good. He was, he that, was that good that he actually ha- he actually had a direct line to God. It was yeah. It was like, listen, God, I go on seven o'clock. If you can make it rain while I'm singing Purple Rain, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, I mean that that was one of the things where I never like you you, you, grow, you grow up with kids in the eighties and you, you enjoyed Prince's music, but like he was just like you know you know he, he was the weird guy who wasn't as weird as Michael Jackson. Right. Yeah, that's a way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> and then when with the Super Bowl show, I didn't I never realized exactly how good of a musician he was. Yeah. Because it was my first time I actually saw Prince perform live. I mean, everything else, like he, he would be like on like, you know, the, the Tonight Show or something where he would just be doing like, you know, one of those performances where it's they half assed it just to get to the commercial break. So this was my first Prince concert. And that was the first time I noticed exactly how 
wow, this, this dude can actually play. Yeah, they. Uh, I, I forget who described it, but they said, you know, there are artists out there who play a lot of instruments. Prince is like a genius on all of well, those instruments. <laughs> exactly. And um, yeah, for anybody who hasn't who hasn't seen it, there was a, um, I think it was uh, George Harrison's induction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they played uh, "While My Guitar Gently Weeps." Yes. And, Pr and Prince came out, I think, just to do the guitar solo. Yeah. A and th th that was another that was another time where I know it was like, oh wow, he actually plays a guitar and. Wow, he's the best guitar player on that entire stage right now. Yeah, and and you have like I think it was like I think Tom Petty was on stage. I think Eric Clapton was on stage. Yes, and you know here comes you know Prince, all five foot one of them, uh, and just yes, just if, 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 if they destroyed. were known as being a guitar a, a guitar god at that point, there was a ninety percent chance they were all on stage, and Prince blew them all away. Yeah, my uh, 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 Prince died uh, how many years ago? We were probably like five, six about years about ago. Five or six, yeah. Five or six years ago. And um, when, when he passed away, a buddy of mine, a buddy of mine shared a, a Prince um, memory. And there was a time where Prince was doing all of these really intimate shows, uh, right. like kind of playing clubs. And uh, my friend was just so excited about it. And uh, he he got tickets. I forget how much he, you know, how much he spent for these tickets. And it was like, I think it was like the third night of Prince's residency at this, at this club. And um, what he didn't know is that each night had a theme. So with somebody with a career like Prince, you know, he's gone through so many different, yeah. um, you know, genres of, of music. Right. So the one night was, I think like his, uh, his rock stuff. And then the other night was like, his R and B, and then there was his pop stuff, like all of his '80s stuff. And my poor friend, he happened to buy tickets. I think it was like Prince's jazz stuff. So he's like, "Oh fuck, man!" So he's like, "There he is," you know, in this club. He wants to hear like Delirious. He wants to hear Purple Rain. He wants, he wants to hear to all that shit. And then you know, there's there's Prince. I don't. Even, I think Prince is on piano. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, doing doing these like, uh, you know, doing jazz. It's like, ah. Oh, yeah. See that that that's actually that's only the second worst concert story I've ever heard. Oh, dude, please if you can. Thankfully, I wasn't there. So, um, my brother Laura and I, he's the, he's the guy basically we'll go to concerts to. We're like, you know, because we're from Long, Long Island and like Taking Back Sunday and you know, brand new and all that. And we had seen Taking Back Sunday a couple of times, and brand new was playing. They were playing um, a show at the Paramount, which is on Long Island. And a show at the um, Starland in Sayreville. And the way it was set up, because they have four albums out, they were going to play two albums one night and two albums, albums the next night. Um, and we figured, well, obviously, Long Island, that they're going to play the two albums that you know people actually like and not <laughs> the two albums that they, they're not going to like. Uh, thankfully, we were not able to get tickets. So I, I, I forgot, we forgot about the show. And the next, this is, this is like around the holidays. So the next day, we were under the city because the, um, he used to work in a city. Went to go pick go pick up uh, like food, like food and a couple bottles for uh, for Thanksgiving. And I'm like, I'm reading a blog. It's like, out of like a thousand people, I think two thousand of them were complaining about the show because they played every song that no one wanted to hear. Oh, man. So people, people who have been following the band since like they were playing people's backyard were showing up. It's like it's like they're gonna play Soko Amaretto live. This is the greatest time ever. It's like. No one likes you. No, no one likes your last two albums, and that, that oh. was what the hometown crowd got. But it, it was along the same lines. Damn. Well, what is that? Yeah, I wonder what that does to your ego. Like, I, I, I was in a a band for like a week in middle school, mm -hmm. um, and I was very serious about my music uh, back then. And my my week in middle school during that week in middle school. Yeah, but yeah, I wonder what that does to you know somebody's ego, where it's like, wow, man, they they friggin' hate they hate this album. But you know what? I'm going to force feed it. Yeah. I mean, the, the weird thing is, I, I think I've always wondered that because bands have to know, I mean, especially as the band gets older, that their audience seems to like less and less of their new stuff. Like sometimes it sometimes it feels like they put out new albums just as an excuse to go touring and play the old stuff, which, at which point why bother? And like, I, I understand as an artist, you want to constantly grow and constantly make new stuff and, you know, make new art. But I, I 
I always wonder what it's like to like when you actually go on stage and like you know all your fans want to hear is the same four songs that you've been playing for the past 20, 25 years. Like yeah. if I go see if, if I go see Bon Jovi, there's a list of like six songs that I want to hear, and none of them came out in the past ten years. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of feel bad, you know, uh, you know, having you know p- perhaps having the opportunity, you know, for future episodes to have like uh, musicians or you know bands, you know, be able to talk to them on my podcast that I love, mm-hmm. and I'm like, and then it turns out the la- I stopped listening to them twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and here they have, they have like 15 different albums and, you know, it's like stuff, stuff, stuff that I never even knew came out. Yeah. Yeah. No, no clue. Uh, what's all right. Th- that I think the closest, the closest I've gotten to something like that, it's not even music. Um, there's a, an author, I won't, I won't say his name, but I've read all of his books mm-hmm. and he hasn't published a book in a really long time. And he, uh, came out with a book that, it it seems kind of like more like fragments or like okay. kind of uh, you know uh, he he had a he had a fulfilled con- a con- contractual obligation yeah yeah and the the book sucks I mean I, I think I I I slog through a hundred pages of it and I was like I can't you know I can't do this but mm-hmm. if I ever get to meet him and talk to him I'm there's no way I'm bringing that book up I'm gonna gonna completely forget it exists yeah I mean the the only and this goes it goes back to taking back Sunday, but the only band where I think I've liked the newer stuff more than the older stuff. Mm. And I wonder sometimes, because I think we're all around the same age. I mean, I think I'm older, but we're all around the same age, all okay, coming up the same place. So I guess as the music grew, like I I you know, I grew the same way. So that like mm-hmm. the, the newer stuff, like you know, still I'll still still relate relate to it, to where like their last album I actually enjoy more than their first album. But yeah, when it when it comes to like 99% of other bands, it's like I it's there was nothing they put out in 20 years that I have any interest in. Yeah. I'd, and they, and they have to know that. And that has to suck. <laughs> they have to know that these guys are, they're, they're going, they're basically doing like, you know, dating profiles and putting their old pictures up. <laughs> that's, 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 that's basically what it is. And then you meet them and they're like, you know, no, no, this is our new stuff. It's like, no, no, yes. I'm, I'm, th- that's not the date I wanted. I did not sign up for it. Yes, the you know the the uh, the, the new Bon Jovi album is the equivalent of of, of him posting a picture of him to, of him still dating Cindy Crawford from 1987. Oh, he dated? Did he really date Cindy Crawford? It may have. They, they, may have they, they did. They at least did a video together. Okay, that that's good. Yeah, I I, I, I may I may have sold him out, so I apologize to his wife if she's watching right now. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sure they were just friends. Yeah. Well, you know, with things, I mean. You know things now nowadays, and you know how this is, where you're you know constantly putting out you know material or commentary, um, you know anything like over a a week or over a month, like I kind of forget that it even that I even put it out or, or that it, it exists. Um, and uh, recently, I had a, a producer of a show reach out to me to uh, to come on and be a guest on, I guess, like this panel show. Okay, and uh, he wanted me to talk about Colin Kaepernick. Because I had written a piece for Spiked Magazine, I think it was in like November of last year, about um, Colin Kaepernick, specifically about the uh, docu series, uh, the dramatic series of his life. I think it was like a six part series um, about his life in high school and okay, growing the, up. The, the fictional, no, the fic- I don't mean fictional, yeah, fictional, the, the fictional one. Yeah, the, the one that the one that starts with him talking about uh, the NFL being, you know, like slavery. You know, um, so oh, so 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 that that that's like his regular material because I know he did that in the Netflix special also. That that's what I'm talking about, the Netflix special. Oh, right on. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, yeah, it. that uh, you know that that part, um, and uh, you know, it's like I wrote this in November. I don't know. I haven't kept up on Kaepernick and what's going on. <laughs> and then I'm like, and then uh, you know, it's like, oh, what what would I be getting into? You know, what are they? You know, is it is it sort of Oh, let's bring this guy on and then let's just clobber him, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I was, you know, I was willing to do the show. It turned out that uh, I wasn't able to, uh, th- there was a, a scheduling conflict at that time. So I, would, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But I said, you know, I'll, I'll be down to, uh, you know, think of me in the future, you know, if you want to have me on. And what was so funny is then I, you know, I just started checking out like the producer's Twitter feed, you know, to see what, you know, what he's up to. Mm-hmm. And this dude, <laughs> this dude made two videos like handheld on his on his iPhone talking about uh how this white woman uh he's a black man this okay. white woman had said that said to him that uh 
she had dated uh, chocolate men before. And he, you know, kind of took offense to that. And I think, yeah, you know, rightfully so. He had a, you know, he had a point. He said, you know, if I wasn't gay, um, uh, I wouldn't want to be with you anyway. He's like, I don't want to wake up next to someone who smells like a canine. And I was like, oh. And then, and then I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of, that's something there. The producer of this show has this out. And then he had a follow-up video basically saying, don't get mad at me. I Googled this. There are studies out there that say white people, some white people smell like dogs. And I was like, oh, man, I might miss the most fun panel of my life getting to be on that one. Either that or a complete, or a complete setup where you'd be canceled right now. Yeah, yeah. It's like what would like, they like, 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 like from your apartment? You'd be back. Actually, you, you, you wouldn't be back in Brooklyn because you probably, you probably be kicked out of Brooklyn. Also, yeah. It's like, yeah. What do you guys? I mean, do. Yeah, it's like what? <laughs> what what's the proper? You know, what's the response? Do I get to bring that up? Like, hey, can we talk about your producer and the yeah. you know, the the wet dog comment and the and, or it's the like, dog yeah, comment? I, yes, yes. I may, I I may think I may think it's inappropriate for Colin Kaepernick to compare being um. A multi-million dollar athlete to being a slave. Uh, I also think it's inappropriate to say that white people smell like dog. Yeah, different strokes. <laughs> different, different strokes. I actually want to. Yeah. Uh, but <coughs> now, now I'm actually now I'm actually wondering. I'm like maybe you know, maybe I, I can't smell it because I am it. You know, maybe it's one of those yeah, things. Maybe maybe that is the thing. Because they they say you never smell your own your own odor. And if you only if you only hang out around white people, then you, you don't smell it. There you don't smell the dog. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a reason why like dogs get really vicious around me. You know, maybe, they, maybe maybe they have a point, and it's the science. Yeah, and I I definitely mark my territory uh, where, <laughs> wherever I go. Uh, but uh, Brodigan, uh, we're we're out of time. Uh, okay. Well, not well, not really. I mean, we have all the time in the world. It's just I know we both got to get back to uh, stuff. But yes, I uh, I want to thank we, you. We actually have work to do. Yeah, I, I want to thank you so much for uh, uh, for spending time with me. Uh, please let everybody know where they can find your stuff. You can find me on the louderwithcrowder.com website. Uh, you could also find me on at Brodigan at Twitter. And you can find me stalking Lou in his bushes. There we go. Oh, there you are. I see you. Out. <laughs> Listen, it's weird. You have a whole setup, but you're. Yeah, you're I, gonna... I actually, I, I, brought, I brought my ring light. I brought, I brought my back book and I, I brought a portable charger. Thank you so much for listening. And again, please order my book. That joke isn't funny anymore on the death and rebirth of comedy. Just follow the link in the description or head over to Amazon and search for Lou Perez. That joke isn't funny anymore. And please subscribe to my podcast. Leave a five-star review. Why not? Sign up for my newsletter at theluperez.com. And if you want other ways to support my work, you can join theluperez.locals.com. And of course, be sure to support my sponsors. PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Use promo code Lou for 25% off purchases over $75 and Black Organic Cold Brew. B-L-V-C-K-B-R-E-W.com. Use promo code Lou for free shipping. Thank you.